Welcome back to our study in the book of Revelation. This is going to be Revelation part 12 in our series, and we've gotten up to the sixth trumpet in chapter 9. So let's pick it up in verse 13. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So what's the significance of the river Euphrates? This river is going to be the farthest northeastern boundary of the future kingdom of Israel in the millennium. If you look at the covenant that God made with the Israelites, he promised them land that extended all the way to the river Euphrates. Now, the river Euphrates was also known as the boundary that would keep Israel's enemies at bay. Anytime enemies came against the nation of Israel, they would cross the Euphrates River. So this river has a lot of significance to the people of Israel. Now, this prophecy is global in scope. This is not just about the land of Israel. Okay, now, I don't know if there are literally angels bound in the water. It says that they're bound in the river Euphrates. Well, we know Satan will be bound. When we get to Revelation chapter 20, it says that he is bound with a great chain. Now, a lot of people have a problem with the idea of angels being bound because they think of them as immaterial. And it is true that angels are spirit beings. But you must understand, even in heaven, the spiritual realm, there are physical objects. Okay? God sits on a throne. The city is described as having gold and certain elements and precious jewels all with the atomic structure that is found here on this planet. So spirit beings somehow can interact with matter. I don't know how it works, but God can bind Satan with a chain. I don't know if it's made up of metal, like the metals you would find on our planet, or some other element that we don't know about yet. But nonetheless, angels can be bound. But here's one thing we know. Bound angels are not good angels. Okay, God doesn't ever bind a good angel. But we know from Scripture that the bad angels are bound. It says in 2 Peter 2, verse 4, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. All right, so here we see that some angels are in chains being kept until the day of judgment. Jude, verse 6, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So there are some angels who are bound in the earth, in hell. And this really isn't a problem because we just saw demonic locusts come out of the earth. So obviously deep within the earth, demon spirits, fallen angels, some of them are being held in chains and they're going to be released in God's proper time. And when they are released, it's not going to be good for the people of the earth. Now, these four angels that are mentioned, they're not given a name, but they were probably at one time demon princes, like we read about in Daniel chapter 10. Remember, Satan assigns his lieutenants over nations and families and people. But there are high-ranking principalities that reign over nations. They might have been the demonic princes that Daniel predicted would come against the nation of Israel. Remember, he saw four different beasts. He saw the statue and predicted that empires would rise and fall. So it's possible that these were those demon princes that were over those nations. If you think about it, where did the demon princes go when Michael fought against them? Remember in the book of Daniel, how when Gabriel finally shows up, he says, I've been fighting these demons for 21 days. We heard your prayer, and we right away went to work. But we've been fighting these evil entities in the heavenly realms. Well, what did Michael do with those demons? He probably put them in the pit. Remember when Jesus encountered demons, how they said, please, please don't send us to the pit. So there is a holding place for these evil entities. And these four angels which were probably demon princes at one point, have been held there, and they're going to be released and kill a third of mankind when this sixth trumpet blows. And so this takes us to verse 15 in Revelation 9 that says, So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. So in other words, there is a specific time 
that God has prepared when these angels will be released. That's all that means. All right, now in verse 16, it says, The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. So in other words, this is not a symbolic number. It says he heard the number, so there's no reason to change it. Just it's 200 million, and that's what it is. And right, and then in verse 17, And this is how I saw the horses in my vision, and those who rode them. They wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. Verse 18, By these three plagues a third of mankind was killed, by the fire and the smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. Verse 20, The rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Now, this 200 million army, a lot of people have said over the years that this is China, communist China. I think it was back in the 60s or 70s, China announced they could form an army of 200 million men. And how Lindsay made this popular in his teachings. Well, it doesn't say that. It's possible. But I don't believe this has anything to do with China. It is possible that these demons that are released influence humans, which is what they do, to form an army. This could be a Muslim army. There are plenty of Muslims throughout the world that if they wanted to, they could form an army of this size and they could unleash havoc on the world. Who knows? We'll know it when it happens. So this could be a literal demonic army or it could be demons possessing humans or influencing humans to form an army. Whatever it is, like I say, we're going to know it when we see it. Now, their breastplates are described as being the color of sapphire, which is a blue color, sulfur, which is a yellow color. I would say the fact that John is able to be so specific means he's really seeing something. For him to get into the colors and the details of what he's seeing means he really saw this. This is not something he's just seeing in his imagination. He's not making all of this up. He is seeing details and he is describing it. And I think we need to stick with a literal interpretation. John is describing in literal terms what he saw. So these are demonic hordes. We don't need to make this modern warfare like tanks and helicopters and all of that stuff. Let's just stick with what the text says. And if we're wrong, we'll know it when it happens. And at that point, it won't really matter because time is up and you better get your life right with God. And it might be too late at this point. Who knows? All right, that's all of chapter 9. Now let's get into chapter 10, verse 1. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. Now a lot of people have erroneously said this is Jesus Christ. But notice it says, then I saw another mighty angel. This is another of the same kind of angel. This isn't a different type of angel. Yes, in the Old Testament, there was the angel of the Lord. And this was the pre-incarnate Jesus. All right, but Jesus is not an angel. He's never referred to as an angel after his resurrection and ascension. No, this is an angel, and it is a mighty angel. Now, angels are very strong. They're very mighty. They're so strong, in fact, that they make Superman look weak. Look at Revelation 18, 21. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea. Do you know how heavy millstones are? They're incredibly heavy. But this angel just picks it up like it's a baseball and just throws it like no problem. In 2 Kings 19.35, And that night the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. Superman could not kill 185,000 people that quick. But an angel could. This was one angel. Killed 185,000 Assyrians. These are very powerful beings, and they don't have to be near a yellow sun to stay strong like Superman. They can be anywhere in the universe. Now, the reason people 
call this angel Jesus is because he is described in similar terms. It says that he came down from heaven and he was wrapped in a cloud. And we know from scripture that when Jesus comes back, he's going to come in a cloud. And then we see over this angel's head a rainbow and his face was shining like the sun and his legs were like pillars of fire. And we'd read in Revelation chapter one, a very similar description. In verse 13, it says, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze. You see the similarity there? Refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Well, to clear up this problem, you got to remember something. Anytime someone comes from the presence of God, they're going to be shining with light. Do you remember Moses when he came down from the mountain? He had to put a veil over his face because he had been in the presence of the glory. And when you're in the presence of the glory, it does something to the cells of your skin and you end up emitting light. Think about this also. When Jesus was resurrected, right after his resurrection, He wasn't shining with glory, although he did have a new glorified body, but because he had not yet ascended and been in the presence of the glory, they didn't even recognize him when they came to the tomb. They thought he was the gardener. Look at John chapter 20, verse 14. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Now, how would she not know that it was Jesus? I thought he was in a new glorified body. Why was he not shining with glory? Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, see, she thought it was the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. So we have one example of them not even recognizing Jesus, yet he was in his glorified body. But later in Revelation chapter 1, we just read how John saw Jesus. At this point, Jesus had been in the presence of the glory for many years. See, John wrote the book of Revelation around AD 95. Jesus had been in the presence of the glory for decades. So when he appeared to John, John sees white hair like wool, eyes like fire, his feet were like burnished bronze. That's because he had been in the presence of this intense glory. And Moses, he was shining with glory, and he wasn't even in a glorified body. So these angelic beings, when they show up, they are shining with glory. This angel had a rainbow over his head because of the light he was emitting. It was interacting with the molecules in the air around him, and it created a rainbow. It says his legs were like pillars of fire, just like Jesus's were like burnished bronze, because he had a suntan, so to speak, a spiritual suntan. These angels are in the presence of God, and God is emitting brilliant light called glory. And when you come out of that presence, you too emit bright light. You can't help but do it. If you remember the transfiguration, look at Luke chapter 9, verse 30. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory. See, they appeared in glory. Why? Because they had been in the presence of God for centuries. Moses and Elijah had been dead for hundreds of years. But when they showed up on earth, on the Mount of Transfiguration, they too were emitting bright light. So it's not a mystery that this angel shows up emitting light. So it's not Jesus just because he's emitting glory. Remember, the angels of God can emit glory. This happened when the shepherds were in the field, remember, and the angels appeared and they were saying, glory to God in the highest when Jesus was born. They saw bright light. So don't think that this is Jesus just because he is described in similar terms. You've got to learn to rightly divide the word. Now let's go on in Revelation 10, verse 2. Let's read a little bit more about this angel. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice, like a lion roaring, when he called out the seven thunders sounded. Now, it's significant when it says that his feet were standing on the land and sea. 
because this means that whatever he's standing on, he is claiming as his own. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 24. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Zechariah 14.4, a prediction about the coming Messiah. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. So, when this angel stands on the land and sea, that is a symbolic way of saying, I am claiming this for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is taking back his property. Verse 4, And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. Isn't that very interesting that here in the book of the unveiling, where we're supposed to be getting revelation knowledge, John is told, no, do not write what you just heard. Now, I have actually met people in person that have written books that say they know what these seven thunders are. And I'm just like, well, if John was told not to write it, then why all of a sudden is God telling you what it is? Are you supposed to be adding to the book of Revelation? Should we add what you say to the end of the Bible? No. Nobody knows what these seven thunders are. And if God wanted us to know, he would have said, write it down. So there's obviously something here that we're not supposed to know. I don't know what the seven thunders are, but to sit here and speculate, it's just human invention, and it's not going to get us anywhere. Verse 5, And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay. In other words, it's happening, you better hold on tight, because God is not going to hold back. Verse 7, But that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. So the mystery of God here has nothing to do with the mystery of the church. He says clearly, his servants, the prophets. So this has to do with prophecies concerning the day of the Lord and the inauguration of the messianic kingdom. The angel is simply saying, when that seventh angel blows his trumpet, the mystery of God that all the prophets wrote about would be fulfilled, and you're going to see it come to pass. That's all he's saying. Verse 8, then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And that is the way truth is. Truth can be bitter, but it can also be sweet. See, you've got to have a balance to understand the nature of God. You can't just take the sweet stuff, all the lovey-dovey stuff, and leave out the wrath. All right, And you can't just preach wrath, the bitter stuff, and leave out the honey. So, it's bitter and sweet. God is love and wrath. Love and justice. There's a balance. And that's what truth teaches you. That there is a bitter side to this for those who do not know God, those who reject Christ. And we see this even in the book of Ezekiel. Look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And he said to me, Son of man, eat whatever you find here. Eat this scroll and go. Speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me this scroll to eat. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly with this scroll that I give you, and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. So the purpose of eating the scroll isn't to literally eat paper. What it means is to ingest or take in God's word, God's truth. And notice that the reason he was told to do it was so he could go and speak to the people of Israel. And John was similarly told, eat this because you're going to prophesy about many peoples and nations and tongues. And that's what we need to do. We need to feed on God's word so we can go into this dark world and share the gospel of Christ. And when we learn the truth, we learn the bitter truth that some people will be damned. Some people will perish. But the sweet part is, some people will come to the truth, they will come to Jesus, and they will be saved. And now verse 10, And I took the little scroll 
from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter, and I was told, You must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. And so there you have it. John is told to eat the scroll, digest God's word, so you can prophesy, so you can teach my word. All right, that's the end of chapter 10 and a really good place to stop. In the next video, we're going to get into the two witnesses, chapter 11. And notice that just like between the sixth and the seventh seal, there is some extra material added to explain some things. So here between the sixth trumpet and seventh trumpet, we have additional material. So we haven't even gotten to the seventh trumpet yet. All right, so that's coming. But we're going to get into the two witnesses, and we're going to get into the seventh trumpet in the next lesson. So I'll see you there.